So hello and welcome to another interview with experts. I'm Frederick Dunn and this is The Way to Be. You may be curious about a new hive entrance called Protect a Bee by Best for Bees, recently featured in both February and March 2022 issues of Bee Culture Magazine. Joining me today is Dr. Erica Shelley. Dr. Shelley is the founder of Best for Bees. Here's Erica. Hi, I'm Erica Shelley, founder and CEO of Best for Bees. We're located in Kitchener, Ontario, and we provide beekeeping and honeybee and bumblebee research services for companies, as well as designing and producing products to improve bee health. Thanks. Well, it's really great to have you, and thank you for accepting the invitation to be here and talk about bees in general, but specifically, of course, your new entrance design, which is just releasing now. In other words, people can't buy it. So what we're going to be talking about today is uh, being launched as an Indiegogo campaign, which is how I got my interest. I also invested in your campaign. So we have no affiliations. So this is not some promo to get me benefits. So the only benefit is having the inventor here today to talk about it. So if you would, Erica, just tell us a little bit about your background, first of all, why you even care about honeybees before you arrived at what we're doing now. What we're doing right now. All right, so so full disclosure, I got into beekeeping for the honey. <laughs> so it, it wasn't to you know, help the bees or you know all, all of these issues. I just actually really loved honey. This was over 10 years ago now. And so I think I came into it from a place of a lot of hobby beekeepers in that, um, you know, we, I just was going to have a couple of backyard hives and, uh, and, you know, do the hobby beekeeping thing. But I also am a scientist, uh, you know, I've, I've been a researcher uh, for years and the, the scientist in me started, uh, you know, looking more closely at, at bees and their health. And, uh, and, and that just kind of led into uh, this consulting uh, company that I had, uh, Best for Bees, where I started helping uh, companies with um, studies looking at honeybee health with, uh, you know, pollination, uh, determining where to put bees. Um, we work with seed companies, all sorts of, of different companies. Uh, universities, which is that affiliation that we now have with the University of Guelph with our, our current product. And uh, yeah, so so I have I have honey and now I have lots and lots of bees. And uh, and I, I know uh, a lot more about bees than I ever, ever imagined when I, I bought those first couple of hives over 10 years ago. Oh, that's great. And uh, what is your affiliation with the University of Guelph? In other words, did you attend as a student there? What uh, is the extent of your connection with them? With them, yeah. So I actually, I'm from the United States originally. So I grew up um, in Arizona uh, many years ago and went to Johns Hopkins University, did my PhD at Oregon Health Sciences University. And I met a really sweet uh, Canadian guy and <laughs> ended up here in Canada. And, uh, and so that's, that's kind of why I ended up in this area. So the University of Guelph, um, they, they knew about, and Peter Kevin, who uh, runs the, uh, the, the program, the bee vectoring program at the University of Guelph, uh, knew about, about me and my services as well as my background, my graduate work studying fungi, which uh, there's an intersection between his project and fungi as well, uh, which is now um, our, our company's project as well. And that, that's where that affiliation came from. Although I will say that I do have a 23 year old son and he graduated from the University of Guelph last year. So oh. <laughs> I, I have paid for tuition at University of Guelph, just not for my own. <laughs> oh, that's good. And What's he studying there? Oh, he well, he's all done, but he was a computer computer science. Of course. Of yeah. Course. <laughs> and Which making day? more money than I will ever make in my lifetime, yes. <laughs> all right. So he's a capitalist. That's safe to say. So, <laughs> um, so listen, you mentioned Peter at University of Guelph. Is he the one that shows up on their YouTube channels that's running their apiary? 
practical testing and everything? No, that no, those, those, that's, that's the Honeybee Research Center. Okay. And so Peter Kevin's in the School of Environmental Science. And uh, Peter actually has two different bees that have been named after him. Like he's, he's considered sort of a, um, you know, just a, a, a huge, you know, historically, he's added so much to the field of honeybee biology and native bee pollinators. And, uh, and he, even in terms of different ecological systems, like it, he, across the gamut, he, he's done many, many things within uh, the, the field of, of bees. That's really interesting because uh, a lot of people may not recognize this, but there are over 20,000 species of bees all over the world. And getting one named after you, though, is no small thing. Obviously, yes, so that's too. a big deal. I'm putting, yeah. a, I'm, I'm putting a star by his name because that's good. And did, do you yeah, know what? You, you should get him in to come in and chat one time. He loves, he loves having chats, yeah. for sure. Do you know what the bees were named? Um, you know what? I, I, I think one's something like Kevin Knight, Kevin Knightus or something like that. And, and I don't recall what the other one was. I just know that there's, there's two. That's, yeah, I, that's, I, really, I really should know that. Shouldn't I? I, I that's, it's, I it would have been nice if you knew and had it <laughs> handy, but, uh, yeah, it's much better than giving it a, a number or something else. It's bold to name things after yourself. Um, oh, he didn't, he didn't name it after himself. So I, that's what other bold. people named it after him. That's, oh, they did. They did. Yeah. So he's just, he's just revered in that field. Right. So when people identified these bees, they're like, this is the guy that it, it can be named after. Yeah. And you're keeping bees yourself in Canada right now. Oh, I have, I have bees. Um, I have a couple different research apiaries and then we have bees on top of buildings through the city. We have clients um, spread all over southwestern Ontario, as well as farms and companies. And yeah, a lot, you, a lot of hives. When you say buildings in the city, are they, do you have any rooftop apiaries? Oh yeah. Yeah. I've got, I've got some really high up rooftop apiaries. Uh, so I also, so um, another uh, part that we do with our company is we, we have like a, a corporate uh a corporate mandate where we uh, teach people about the importance of bees. And we actually talk a lot about native pollinators, but we use honeybees as a, a vehicle to open up that conversation. And uh, so basically as green initiatives, corporations will have us put, com put hives at their locations, which often tend to be rooftop locations. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then it allows us to, to open up the, the conversation about the importance of bees and and what you can plant and the, and the habitat and, and so on and so forth. And we also have um, two at our local uh, public library that people can actually look right out at and uh, watch what they're doing. They got a little nervous uh, a couple of weeks ago when the bees started flying and there were a lot of dead bees on the snow. And, mm. yeah. <laughs> and I'm that like, is, no, yeah. no, that's, that's a great sign. We're happy to yeah. see that's them. That's alarming. That's alarming when people see that because they don't understand the normal uh, cleansing flight, die outs in cold weather and things like that. Yeah. So at the library, is it in some kind of courtyard where it's kind of protected? Exactly. It's a it's a second floor courtyard and it's just it's just perfect because people can just stand and they're they're right at eye level where the bees are kind of coming in and out. And yeah, it's a fantastic location. And the other thing you mentioned that I'm really interested in, because someone recently wrote me, um, they're at the 20th story of a high rise in Brooklyn, New York. And they were concerned that the bees wouldn't be able to handle that altitude to locate the apiary. And so, and I told them that that's doable because the bees certainly find it. That's perfectly fine. But 20 stories, we're talking about, you know, well over 160 <laughs> feet. So what is the highest rooftop apiary where your colonies are currently located? Um, okay, so this is interesting. My tallest one is probably only four stories high. So okay. that doesn't sound sound very um, high, but these the stories of this building are huge. Uh, so I don't know, I don't know how many, I'm going to try to like think of, I would say maybe, I would say like, uh, maybe a couple hundred feet, like I'm trying also, to think. Of, that's a lot for a four-story building. Yeah, it's a huge building. It's an absolutely yeah. huge building. 
And, and Fred, I'm going to say something that, that maybe people don't want to hear. My, my rooftop apiaries do not do anywhere as well as my ground, my ground bees. Okay. Uh, they, they're, they do have to deal with wind. They're farther from sure. food resources. But they generally, especially the ones that are up higher, don't have to deal with predators. Like the wasps don't tend to go up there and, and other types of predators. So they oh, yeah. do have that yeah. advantage. Yeah. So, I mean, there's advantages to it. But in general, I've just found that my... Um, my ground level apiaries do way better than rooftop apiaries. Yeah, and I'm and I'm glad you mentioned that because the reason people are keeping them on rooftops and probably one of the most famous rooftop apiary locations is in right next to the Notre Dame Cathedral mm -hmm. uh, in Paris, and uh, they look down on Notre Dame, so that gives you an idea of how high up they were. But uh, yeah, it's an opportunity to green an area that otherwise isn't used in a concrete jungle where the options are limited. And uh, right, so they're making the best of kind of the city environment. Yeah, yeah. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna add one more reason that we actually have more rooftop apiaries here maybe than other places is we actually have uh, legal limits of how close beehives can be to a property line. Oh. And uh, those property lines don't extend up into the air. So if you can actually go, the uh, for us it's 30 meters. If you can go that high into the air, you've actually could be right at the property line and still be legal in terms of, of where you have your hive. Is, is that 30 meter standoff required throughout Canada or just in specific provinces? Just in specific provinces, it, it, okay. it varies from province to province. And, and they're working on changing that. It's, you know, it's, you know, um, the, the, I would say in general, that rule is broken a whole lot. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, making something that is workable for, you know, beekeepers and people is, is really important to, to that whole, whole industry and collaboration between, you know, apiary inspectors. If people don't have their hives legal, they uh, may not, they might be less likely to report that they even have bees or that they have issues with bees. So when you say they're going to address that, are they planning to relax it or increase that barrier? Oh, they're, I think they're going to, so it's uh, for us, it's the Ontario Beekeeping Association that's been working on it for a little while. And I will admit, I've not kept up to date with exactly what their, their current goals are. There was a time when I, I paid a little bit more attention to that. Um, it, I feel like it may be like, I, I, it might be like two hives per property kind of situation. So not necessarily where it's located in terms of the property line, but mm -hmm. in terms of how many hives you have, but don't quote that. I, I'm on a, I'm on a podcast at a YouTube channel. Do not quote. Yeah, me no, these I'm are, yeah, totally this, is, <laughs> this is two people drinking coffee, talking about I what's got, going on in beekeeping. Coffee. <laughs> this is not, I'm sure some people look at this and go, wait a second, aren't we talking about some new entrance configuration? What's with all the background? Well, because beekeeping is interesting across the board and what people are doing where is uh, a lot of fun to know about. So, but I will get to why we're here, which is uh, Protect a Bee is the name of the entrance or is it the name of the company? No, the company's Best for Bees, which has okay. my, been my company for a long time. We're just switching gears now, learning how to advertise products and sell products and deal with distributors and, um, mm -hmm. you know, customer service, that, that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Protective Bee is, is the, the multi, um, our adjustable, all-in-one adjustable um, entrance for, for beehives. Okay. And that's what we're talking about. And one of the reasons I wanted to get you on fast is because Protect a Bee, that entrance is part of an Indiegogo campaign right now. Uh, the other thing is it just came out for those who don't know. Ta-da. So those of you who read Bee Culture Magazine, the January 22 issue, you have to turn to page 34. Not right now. Oh, wait, do you have, do you have the, Feb do you have the February issue? What's in the February issue? We're, we're actually on the front of the February issue. It says protect to be across the top. And then our farmer studies are on that one. Okay, well, I only have, I'm sure the other one is in a stack somewhere, but you can tell I did my homework. I have you highlighted. Did your homework. I love it. This is the good one. This is the science one. Um, I shouldn't say the good one. The okay. other one is is from our, our beta testing with beekeepers, but mm -hmm. 
if you're interested in the science, that's that's the more science uh, side of things. So you are on the cover of it's also Bee Culture, and it's yes. the, Febru- yes. the February issue. Yep. Okay, so people can look. I have it, but I have to like leave and walk in. No, no, I'm not going to do that. (laughs) Stay where you are. Do not put up that static. (laughs) My little picture. Okay. All right. It's okay. I'm just going up. But but that's okay. At least we now have two sources that people can look, and these are searchable. Plus, for those of you who are watching, and if you're on Podbean, listening to this as a podcast, the links are in the description of the video, and the links are also in the description of the podcast YouTube channel channel for the Indiegogo campaign as well, and also your main channel, which is, and I wrote it, Best for Bees. Bestforbees.com, yeah. Okay, bestforbees.com. Anyway, the, the links will be good. So let's talk about it. Um, what got you involved in, first of all, of all the things that we could do for a beehive, why some kind of entrance modification and kind of what were your original concepts like as compared to what you arrived at now and why you're trying to mark this specific configuration that you have. All right. So this is, I love talking about this, Fred. So this is just really great to, to talk. I mean, we've been working on this for two, two years and uh, this project did not start as a hive entrance at all. So we work, um, the lab that I, I was hired by Peter Kevin's lab, um, our company, uh, we were work, We were brought in to work on a project called the Inspensing Project. And so Peter Kevin, he's been involved with uh, bee vectoring, uh, where bees walk through a powder that's actually a fungus, and that powder sticks to the bees, and then the bees fly, and as they, they do their regular pollination visits, they leave, leave little bits of this powder behind this fungus. And that fungus actually provides protective properties to the the plant or the fruit that's coming up because the fungus will actually start growing and it prevents other fungi from growing on those plants and it also prevents pests and it can grow on the pests themselves. And uh, and it's just a a very um, one alternative to natural because these fungi are already um, native to the soil there. So we're not like bringing in something that that wasn't already existing in the area. And very, um, it's not a one-time application. You have these bees that are flying every day, right? So it's not like the farmer needs to get out there and be putting down, you know, uh, pesticides or or fungicides because they've got the bees doing the work for them. So Peter, uh, 30 years ago, he actually came up with this idea of, of bee vectoring, which um, they, it's, he didn't call it bee vectoring, he calls it apivectoring. So that's um, the, te- the technical term that we use for it. And, um, and, and so he worked with scientists actually all over the world on this project to to get bee vectoring so that it could be used to treat crops. So so there's actually a company um, uh, very near me, so like within an hour called Bee Vectoring Technologies, and they actually provide a system um, that does mount on the front of a hive that that sprinkles powders over the bees as they go out and they they do their pollination visits. So Peter, all the while had been thinking, and I should say Dr. Kevin, uh, Dr. Kevin all the while had been thinking that um, it, that the same technology could be used to bring beneficial powders into a beehive. And so he, call, he calls that inspensing and outspensing is, is to the crops. So, mm-hmm. so I was brought into this inspensing project because uh, our, we, we basically, with our company, we do honeybee health studies. So uh, we, 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 we do an experiment, but then we also look at, okay, how are the bees doing when we've put these new conditions onto the, onto the hive, right? So we have all these metrics, parameters that we're looking at to make sure that the colony, um, not make sure that the colony is healthy because it might not be healthy. So our, our job is basically to say, is this affecting colony health or is it not affecting colony health? And, and so we were, we were brought in to um, partner up with them. So we were the corporate partner, um, which often happens with universities. Um, we have grants here that allow for these partnerships and, and funding for these projects. 
And, uh, and so that's, that's how we ended up on this project. And in fact, the prototype that we started out with did not go on the front of a hive. You had to actually lift the brood box and put this entire <laughs> tray, it was huge, like it was the size of a bottom board underneath the brood box and it had these little ramps. And then the idea was that the bees would come in on the bottom level, walk through the, the powder and go up the ramps and then they would fly out the, the top level. And we had a two year grant based on that particular prototype. So I had a number of research assistants. We got a bunch of these made up for our research apiary and, uh, and we started our experiments because we, we kind of assumed this was already a working prototype. Some graduate students have worked with it in the past and it did not work. It did not work at oh. all. The bees, the bees just do what they want. And not only that, it, it did the exact opposite of what um, sort of we had now. You now had a double sized opening, right? So now really easy for predators to, to get in there as well, right? It's, it, it was just, um, it, it was difficult. And then like taking it on and off, like, you know, in August, who wants to be lifting their, their brood box up um, and, and pulling off, I, I say August, because that's our, our busier beekeeping season here. Mm -hmm. So imagine whenever you're busier, busier beekeeping or your, your, your bees, the bees uh, population is higher, um, taking it off at that time of year, it, it's just, you know, madness. So we, uh, I realized that we had to come up with something new. Right, we we needed to do something that was different than that, and so I um, I thought about it a lot, but I also reached out to a lot of beekeeping groups. I was on a beekeeping hacks page, like I was like, hey guys, what do you think? What are some of the things that we could do? And people started talking about funnels, and we did use funneling actually for we do um, that outspencing project. We did have some funnels, so. So funneling was kind of already there, the, the idea of, of a bigger to a smaller size, um, but I definitely needed separate chambers because I didn't want them just taking the powder out of the high, right? That's a waste. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was really important that the, that the powder wasn't wasted and that it was brought in. And anybody who's kept bees, like if you've, if you've done cutouts where you've removed bees from a, a building or something and you put strings in there you know within a few days they've dragged entire long strings out of the mm -hmm. hive like they're they're very tenacious in terms of, of moving things out that they don't want inside the hive so so we had to outsmart them and and so uh i it's like the aha moment that every inventor has i woke up at three in the morning i was like the idea of the cones and the two separate chambers and and there's there's more there's more to our um, our protective bee than you see, and, and that's on purpose. So when people do get the protective bee, they'll see there's some differences than what we're actually advertising. So we don't want it knocked off right away. Right. But um, it, the so the cones um, allowed for us to have unidirectional traffic. So the bees would come in and they'd walk through the powder but they can't move the powder out. Like that was the important part of the cones is they can't move the powder out and that the powder would get moved around um, inside the hive. And so um, one of the things that I, I haven't mentioned is you can't just put any powder in there. We have a, a diluent that actually sticks to the bees. It's safe for the bees. So it's- Hold on. <laughs> you just said diluent? Diluent, like something that you dilute your powders with a diluent. Yeah, because somebody's going to go, what, what's that term it's mean? It's a diluent, oh. yeah, okay. yeah. So it's not like you can just throw whatever powder you want in there and it's just going to stick to the bees. Like the bees build up an electrostatic charge when they fly through the air. Um, so we're dealing actually with, um, you know, we want certain attraction levels to be happening, but we don't want it to stick so much to the bees that they can't get it off or it isn't left behind, right? So, um, so uh, you know, that was important too, that we um, had a system where they, we make them walk through that powder because they'll just avoid it. Bees don't know what up or down or anything is. They, sure. If they can get around a powder, they're just gonna walk around it and then, you know, just pile it in a corner, uh, which, which does happen if we don't have all the things in, in place. So we have to basically make sure that they walk through that powder and, mm -hmm. and spread it through the hive. So, our, uh, our first year was basically 
proof of concept. Were we able to get these powders throughout the hive? And so the way we did it was we actually had uh, fluorescent microbeads um, in, yeah. in the diluent itself. And then we were able to track where it was going in the hive. And, and that was crazy successful. Like it was, it, it was spread, um, you know, evenly. And um, I shouldn't say evenly, there was some, definitely some differences, but it definitely was, was spread throughout the hive. And, uh, and so we knew we could do it. And we, we also would measure how much loss we had. So how much were the bees bringing out? And the bees weren't bringing out any once we had our final design. Like we, again, outsmarting the bees is hard and we, yeah. we were able to do that. So let me ask, um, so you've put these micro beads on them and they fluoresce. How did you make those observations? What were the mechanics behind how you could see what's going on in there? Did you have some kind of observation hive? What was going on? No, so um, what we would do is, is uh, so when we put our, um, our microbeads and the diluent, and then we actually add some rice in there as a desiccant because we're pretty humid here in the summertime, right? So, so we, we have to actually make sure things stay fairly dry. Um, we would, um, 24 hours later, we would take out uh, frames and we would cut out comb and then we would analyze that we would actually suspend oh. that comb and then look at it under a microscope um, in a dark room with a black light like that's that's it and then we were actually counting the number of particles per um, comb um, or per yeah per per cell basically uh, so that we could actually get an exact number of, of how much we had spread throughout the hive so it's you know very very exact uh, because we need to know that as we move into um, especially like if we're working with antibiotic powders or certain things like that, that you don't want too much of something at, there, we actually need the, to know the exact doses so that we are distributing the right dosage to the hives that will, you know, get what we, um, the, the positive effects that we want without the, any sort of negative implications or negative outcomes. Because, you know, bees are, are tiny little critters and they're pretty sensitive to things. So um, we, we really have to be mindful of that. What were some of the surprises that you found uh, regarding where they distributed that powder? Were there any unexpected areas where they were storing or pushing it to that you were surprised by? Um, so they, they, there was a couple of, of hives that did um, store, store some of the powder as pollen. Mm -hmm. um, but not, not very often. That was just a, a bit of it being stored as pollen, which was, you know, it was like just in the little pollen cells. And then there was like a very glowy <laughs> pollen, pollen yeah. one uh, that happened like pretty infrequently, but that did happen. I mean, that was kind of a surprise. Um, I would say that the rest of it is that, you know, if you think about I mean, we could literally track how a bee travels through a hive based on where these fluorescent powders were. So if we put it on our, so remember this is multi-directional, but we can choose which one's the in and which one's the out. So no, let's say- Can I, do you have one there? I, I do, I do. So let It me, would be great as a, you know, a tool to okay, explain. So, oh, I've got my little fuzzy thing going on here behind yeah. me. So okay. I will undo it here. Hold on, I'm gonna move, um, let's just move this ever so slightly and then, before I undo it, because I believe my dog is right behind me. <laughs> Unless your dog is six feet tall, I don't think it's going to show up. Oh, okay. Okay. So, all right. So let's see, how do I change my background here? That goes into the uh, video, video settings. There we go. There you all right. go. So backgrounds and filters, none. All right. There it is. Yeah. Welcome to my bedroom. Right. <laughs> okay. Nice neutral colors. Nothing's loud back there. I think we're good. Okay. okay. So, so this is one of our original ones. So you'll see, um, we used to have, um, we used to just stick it in. We didn't screw so it on. A cantilever yeah. kind of support. I can't oh yeah. You're on the yeah. podcast. So make sure you, yeah, use the words that, that work best to kind of describe it. So, so this is actually the width of a Langstroth 10 frame high, right? So it fits right in there. It's snug uh, because we don't want any, um, the bees will, 
So one of the things is if it's not snug, the bees just sit there and they like just try to always get into those places they can't yeah. get in, which is not horrible, but you just kind of feel bad for them because they're spending all this time trying to get in where they can't get in. And uh, so here, if you take a look, you'll see that we basically have two chambers and, and those chambers um, have little drawers that pull out. And, and I am holding this up high on purpose, just again, because some of our IP, our patent stuff, I don't actually want to necessarily show here. But, okay. um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so the drawers kind of pull, pull in and out. And, uh, and so this, this drawer can be, uh, that's an N right now is, I don't know that's what your, that is. On you, that's your N, it, Spencer. It's the N part. Um, can be moved to the, the left or the right side, like they're oh. interchangeable. So in fact, what we do is when we, we put the cones on, uh, we'll watch because the bees do tend to um, go in and out on one side in particular. It's not like across the landing board. They don't tend to equally be going out from across the landing board. They'll tend to be coming off from the left or the right. So we'll usually mm. put the in Spencer where they're coming in, where they're landing is where we'll put the in cones and then we'll put the out cones on the other side. Okay. So does that here, I'm like, we can see there and then- Yeah, that's good. I think we've got the concept, so. The concept yeah. there. And, and your new um, version, of course, is a face-mounted version, so rather yeah, than- Yeah, so I have that here. I'm gonna just show you that. So this is our, our latest one. Now, this one is, we're, we're headed to production right now. So this one is, I can't even pull these drawers in and out right now because they have to make these junctions so tight because when it's on injection mold plastic, it will be very smooth, but because it's 3D printed, it's really hard. And I'm gonna show you, when you look in here, this is really hard to push out. <laughs> when, you, when you look in here, there's nothing to see in here. Because again, um, the the IP stuff we've actually um, we've we've actually made it so that you actually add it in. So um, it it will be another insert part that that does go in there for for B vectoring. It's not always needed. So this one you'll see there's two cones. Um, they're both facing in right now, and uh, and and that's that would not be ideal, right? You your bees go, they can come out the ends. So yeah. it's not a hundred percent. They can definitely get out, but it slows them down. So, so one of the things that one of our beekeepers told us is they like they they mow in their backyard, and they said, "Oh, we just started turning these around whenever we would mow, and the bees won't come out and come after us when we're weed whacking or whatever right up by the hive." So we're like, "Oh yeah, we could just flip over those entrances and and now have a little short term um, slow them down from coming out if if they don't like when you're mowing." So yeah, and then the difference is to here. Um, yeah, so this is mounted. Um, and in fact, you can kind of see there's a keyhole, keyhole slot at the top here. And what that allows you to do is, is you put it on your hive, you can just loosen it off and lift it and take it off now. So you can leave those screws there, but it allows you to, to take it on and off easily if you want to do that. So. Um, so we have that as well. And then some of the changes, just minor changes is we have bigger overhangs now. Um, these are, these are recessed in, um, just, just again, we're minimizing the amount of moisture coming in. We didn't actually have too, too many moisture issues. We had the rainiest season on record when we did our second year study and we had rain coming sideways. It was it was like the worst season to be testing powders in. Mm -hmm. And so we actually learned, you know, the desiccant, you know, the amount that we actually needed to use. And I say desiccant, it's rice um, okay. to, to keep it, keep it dry. And, uh, and then we actually got a pretty good idea of um, like how well this dealt in, in rainy conditions. And it actually did great. So the only issues we had with water is the bees that were coming in late would be wet. Right. And then oh, we yeah. do a little bit of clumping from that. So, you know, one of the things we'll recommend is if it's going to rain, you might want to hold off. Right. Uh, or, yeah. you know, before adding the powders, it's, it, mm -hmm. they still got distributed. There's just some clumpy mm -hmm. stuff left behind. So, yeah. And then of course, oh, in our newer version, we have more of a, I don't know if you can even see here on your thing, but we have more of an angle. So oh. that any moisture, snow, whatever can move away uh, from the, the, 
where the it's flush with the the back of the brood box so mm -hmm. so that's also a modification that we've made to it and then we also added some the pools on here i don't know if you can see they're quite big because we know a lot of people are going to have uh their their gloves on their beekeeping gloves on and those can sometimes be bulky depending on what people are choosing to mm -hmm. use so we just wanted to make something that was nice and easy to grasp when you've got those gloves on. So it's not quite as pretty as our original kind of streamlined versions, but a little bit more practical that way. Now you've arrived at, uh, since you've, you're going into production, so you've arrived at final materials that you plan to use. Um, what were those considerations like and how is this thing gonna hold up uh, to ultraviolet light, for example? Yeah, so, um, so, Again, when we were talking about those electrostatic properties with bees, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't realize, but when you look at um, any sort of material that you're, you're using with bees, uh, you have to actually look at how that could potentially affect them. So if they, if they come in, certain types of plastics could actually negatively impact their ability to even bring pollen, like the, they might lose pollen or something like that. So, so it's really important um, for us to not only be looking at what's going to weather well outside, but also what's healthy for the bees and healthy for the hive. So we've chosen plastics <clears throat> that are already being used inside hives. So that was the easiest way for us to go is we already know that those plastics, you know, are being used inside hives, not impacting bee health negatively. So that was um, number one. Number two, we're working with a company um, where, I shouldn't say working with a company. I have mentors and consultants from a local company here called MyoVision who produces uh, smart cities where they have cameras um, that uh, modulate street lights to optimize traffic going through through cities. So they have them throughout the world. And so they're the people that um, have designed uh, their products that are outdoor in all types of weathers. They have, um, and I actually, I say they, Victor Nobre, he's my, my design engineer. Um, he's picked up pla the, the plastics that work inside the hives, but also will last the longest outside. So they're UV light resistant, they're weather resistant, they're not gonna become brittle over time. I mean, over time, like everything becomes brittle, but, but you know, for a long time, I'm not gonna say it's gonna last forever, but I mean, in an ideal world, uh, when I started this project, I really wanted to use a biodegradable plastic, right? Like I was, you know, I, you know, anybody that's in beekeeping loves the environment. They're trying to do their best to, to do what's great for our planet. And I, I really, really researched all the possibilities for like a biodegradable plastic that we could put on the front there. And, uh, and there, there just wasn't anything that wasn't just gonna be thrown away. And so then the next best thing is to have something that's going to last a really long time. So people only need to buy one. And, yeah. and then, and then there's that. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. That's a lot of work that's going into that. And the next question people always want to know, where is it going to be made? So <laughs> um, I'm only laughing because this week we have been, we, we had been working again um, because that company, Myovision and Victor Nobre has been working with a company in China where they've actually gone and they've they've looked at the, they've been there to visit several times. They felt good about uh, the conditions there. Um, the people are very receptive um, and can produce things a lot more quickly for less money, a lot mm -hmm. less money uh, than domestically. Uh, that was our, that's been our plan is to, to produce at least our first run in, in China, just so we can get it out to people for this beekeeping season. Mm -hmm. uh, if we do it domestically, it just won't happen. It's just, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the domestic, um, suppliers just aren't, aren't nearly as quick in getting tools ready and getting, getting the product mm -hmm. ready, um, in the long, so in the long term and maybe even short term, um, we, we may end up. Uh, producing it um, here in Canada, United States, or Mexico. Um, those are the three we're looking at. And, and one of the big reasons we're looking at possibly changing our, our location has because um, cargo shipping's just gone up astronomically mm -hmm. uh, from China. And then even with our flights that we were going to be bringing in, there's a war now. And, and, and so that flight space is actually um, 
interrupt it. That was a big, that's going to actually affect our people. It's going to affect our supply chain. Mm -hmm. all around right so mm -hmm. um so yeah so right now this the, <laughs> was a really long answer fred the short answer is <laughs> we're producing in china to start yeah <laughs> and, but you have long-term goals of producing them locally ultimately. yeah yeah that would be ideal um 75 mm -hmm. of our people that are already buying are from the united states and mm -hmm. and people from the united states love to buy things made in america mm -hmm. and, absolutely yeah, yeah yeah, so we would, you know, we would love to find someone to do that. So um, it, again, people, it, but the matter is if we, if we make it there, it costs more. And so there's, there's that trade off of trying to figure out what's best for, for customers. So that unit is designed for a 10 frame length trough. Uh, do you have an, is it, is that it? Or is there also an eight frame? That is it right now. So okay, I, so 10 frame only. It's only 10 frame, but I get questions all the time about the eight frames. And I did not realize how many beekeepers are doing eight frame hives now. So we had checked in with, um, with the, the companies that, that sell beekeeping equipment and they said, oh, we sell like, we sell about 5% of our equipment is eight frame equipment. Mm -hmm. So we were like, okay, well, we're not going to do that in the beginning, but I'm starting to think that eight frame people just make their own equipment. <laughs> they might be more I, skilled who knows i don't know yeah. Yeah, yeah so there seems to be a lot of them or a lot of them that are interested in this so our next our next goal will be to um we have a couple of things that we're looking at we want it to be able to to work with the ap 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 hives and uh and then also the the eight frames as well so um, we, we do have, um, both of those hives now on hand and we're looking at the various modifications mm -hmm. that we can make to, to make them fit with those. Yeah. Those I couldn't help but notice in all of your advertising, including some of the YouTubes, which I've looked at, you have the flow hive, uh, two plus version with the aluminum legs on it. Is there a reason why you chose that? Does it just graphically look better or are you actually using flow hives with the system? Um, so it works with flow hives. So um, they, it's compatible with the flow hive, the seven frame flow hive, which is the 10 frame box and then seven mm -hmm. of the, the flow frames on the super. Yep. And, uh, and it was, it was twofold. One aesthetics, the flow hives are beautiful, right? They, they do look, they do look really pretty. And yes, yeah, so we picked the, the pretty one that to do for, you know, that eye catching from advertising, mm -hmm. you know, Langstroth hives are, 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 um, pretty, but down where we actually have our device is not where your eyes drawn. Right. So whereas right. on a flow hive, it, it just positions it just so. And the second one is the flow hive was the biggest crowdfunding campaign Indiegogo ever had. So for oh, really? us, yes. <laughs> so it made Oh, by the way, that's for those- I, I noticed it back behind there. That's yeah. one up there and that's one over, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, I um, yeah, so, so that was, yep, that's it right there on that picture. And uh, I ordered that not knowing if they would be compatible. So we did all of our studies with Langstroth hives. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I ordered the flow hive and I was th thinking we were going to have to make some modifications and it just went right on there, like perfectly. Like we were so all doing a happy dance. Can we back up a second? What's the term you just used when you went, what? what is, I'm just oh. using you. <laughs> anyway, so yes. yeah, you would. <laughs> It was perfect. It was perfect. Perfect. <laughs> anyway. Perfect. <laughs> anyway. So, um, but what's actually really interesting that you did that with the flow hive, because I feel a lot of questions about uh, bees from all over. And one of the complaints is actually that the flow hives, uh, they historically have not provided entrance reducers of any kind. Uh, they came out with, uh, I mean, I wish I had one handy. They came out with an entrance reducer that looks like this. Yeah, I have that so, one. And it's vented and everything. But actually, your product is going to satisfy the desire to control the entrance, both for robbing potential, uh, as well as because this is multi purpose, it's not just for somebody who wants to put a treatment out either into the environment or to treat the bees inside the hive. 
it has secondary purposes. Can you explain a few of those? Yeah, so let's, let's talk about the second part of what happened in our research. So we took our product that we developed for B vectoring and we took it out to beekeepers to get beta testing. And, and, and we were really just looking for the bee vectoring to make sure they could use it, they could use the drawers and everything. And, uh, and so the, the idea was they would, they would have it for, for some time and then we would do a little interview and have them fill out a survey. And, uh, and the beekeepers, when we went back, they, they were like, they wanted to buy it right then and there. Like they, and I'm like, why do you want it if we don't even have the powders yet? Like that doesn't make sense. And, and again, this was in the, um, towards the end of summer where we actually have a lot of wasp issues here. Um, and they said that, that the wasps weren't even able to, to eat, they weren't even bothering the hives whatsoever. I had a guy who had had skunk issues. He had like little, you know, spikes out. He'd had all these skunk issues. And he said, he said, they just quit. They just started ignoring that hive with, with the protective bee on the front. Hmm. And then I had beekeepers who, uh, my commercial beekeepers, they're like, you know, you could just put a solid one and you could put feed in there and pollen patties and sugar like you can use it as a, a place to, to to possibly feed them and you could have entrance reducers and anyways yeah. they, they started giving me all these all these possibilities and that that wasn't what we were planning on doing at all like it yeah. was it was just a just a aha moment and and that's when we realized that we could actually start selling this to beekeepers right away before we have all the powders approved because they have to go through fda and epa approval right mm -hmm. Um, but we were able to get this, this out to beekeepers. So let me just talk about the different configurations here. So I'm going to hold this up, but maybe for your podcast people, you can kind of tell them what, what, we've, what we're doing. I'm holding this yeah. down and changing in the, it. In the podcast, we'll have a time link so they can actually click on that and see the video portion. Okay, you. great. All right. So, so this is what we call our alternating cone configuration. And the alternating cone configuration is that what we call an indoor and an outdoor. And in fact, we used to, we would time which the bees would go in and out and, and sort of all sorts of parameters. And the in and out was originally just for bee vector and that was what we had planned on doing it. But when we took it out to our, our beekeepers, they just left that in. And, uh, and that's when they started noticing that the, the, um, the wasps weren't bothering it. And so we originally chose red because bees don't see red, right? That's not, they don't actually actually see red. So, so they wouldn't hang around the edges here trying to get in, right? They would just go for the holes where they see the light and dark. Uh, so it's not like it's invisible. It's not like they can't see. They just right. don't see it as a surface in the same way, right? They like, see it as black. Yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah. and so, and so the entrances. Um, you know, it just keeps them from trying to go in the out and out the end, you know, it's the, the Prince song in through the outdoor, right? So, so let's <laughs> pause on that. So you're saying the bees are registering the physical configuration over any color. It's not just the physical configuration. So the bees will orient and the bees orient, you know, they do their eights, right? So they start little and they get bigger and they get bigger and they get bigger. So they already know where they've come out. Mm -hmm. but they also are going to be mapping that entire area. But when they come back, um, the, the entrance, one, they've learned it if they've done multiple trips. Two, there's a scent, right? There's a scent mm -hmm. that they know. Um, and when we first put these on the hives, there will be fanning as well for the bees to originally kind of say, hey, this is where you want to go in, right? So we do get the fanning behavior there as well. So that, that just lets them know what's what. So Usually within an hour, um, the bees have figured out the in and the out. We do recommend people put it on earlier in the day because you can get clumping if you've had a lot of foragers out and they come back and they're like, what the heck's going on here? Um, or you can put it on at night too, but, but just um, you can put it on in the middle of the day. It just takes a little bit longer for them to figure it out and get a little bit more clumping going well, on. That's a good point. So to reduce some of the confusion, put it on after the daily forage is done. So mm -hmm. sunset. Yeah. Or in the morning is fine too when not that many are out um, or if it's cool, you know, and it takes a while to warm up. Um, but that being said, you don't, you, they do figure it out if you put it on in the middle of the day too. It just, it just takes them a little bit longer and probably slows down their, their timing 
uh, for foraging if you do something like that. So that was our original configuration. The wasps, the reason this works against wasps is first of all, we've only got eight openings that are small. So it's super duper easy for the bees to guard those entrances versus an entirely full open entrance. And anybody's had issues with wasps in the past, you know, you, you end up sometimes throwing on your entrance reducer or putting a, a mesh screen, like, like, you know, we, we're do, do it yourselfers in the bee world, right? We've come up with everything to kind of, you know, allow the bees to protect a smaller area. So this actually does that while actually having um, eight openings, right? So it's, it's um, more than a single opening. So it's a little bit more traffic than if they were just going out through, through the entrance reducer itself. The second is it protrudes out the front of the hive. So it's actually farther away from the food. Uh, so the, the wasps don't smell it as easily too, right? Oh. So you now actually moved away from the food source. And uh, so it's a little bit harder for them. It's, you know, kind of like a robbing screen, but now it's, mm. it's farther out, right? So, um, so it, it does work that way as well. And then of course, in places where you've got, um, so our wasps are not that big, but once you get into yellow jackets or big hornets or whatever, um, there is a size exclusion. But it's really important to note that this size allows drones to get out. Because if drones don't get out, you're just gonna have a ton of drones in there eating food. You want them to go out, you want them to mate and die. You don't want them to just be eating. Also, in terms of maintaining uh, genetic diversity, you also want your drones flying out and mating uh, with queens from other hives. So that's that's also important. And um, and and the, and if the drones cannot get out, there's probably a good chance your, your queen's gonna get out. For cert most certainly a virgin queen would would be able to, to get out from this. So it's not a swarm preventer. A lot of people, you know, like, oh, well, it prevents swarms. And, and I'm not going to say that it would, would prevent right. swarms. So, right. so um, what is the diameter of that cone entrance? Um, that diameter is not something I'm going to share with you. OK. <laughs> but <laughs> proprietary information. You know, so, what? I, I've got so many beekeepers and they're like, I'm just going to 3D print it. And I'm like, yeah. I'm like you guys yeah. have to at least buy one from me to figure out yeah. the dimensions. <laughs> yeah. But the good news is we know the drones get through freely because that's the other thing. And you already addressed it. You know, a virgin queen that needs to complete her flight, her mating flights, um, will still be able to get in and out through that. So yeah. those are all yeah. good points. So, so now talking about the multifunctionality with this, are you okay if I go ahead with that, Fred? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, um, so as I showed you on the earlier one, you can turn both the cones inwards. And, and that's, um, I wouldn't do that for long term, but you know, if you're, if you're mowing or weed whacking, it'll just keep them from, from coming out for a short period of time. Uh, they can still come out, um, the, they can still come out the end. Yeah. Um, it, it's just slower, right? So it's just a lot slower. Um, it's it's not like they can't come out at all. So the other um, options that we have is that you would take out the cones. So the cones would always go together, right? They're they're together, and uh, and this one's really tight. So don't don't mind this. This is our prototype for um, all. Of, I should say that the majority of my um, protective bees are actually out at our research apiary. So when you ask me if you had a prototype, I'm like, well, the one I have is the one that we uh, that we've just printed up for the the pictures that we had, um, and for for our final our final one. So so everything's really tight right now. So um, so first of all, I'll just since I have them out, you can see you can just have this in here open. Mm -hmm. And one of the beekeepers said to us what they really liked about this is that. Um, it actually provides like an even larger landing board. And, and you, if you want to have lots of fanning, you can, you can have that too, right? You know what I just noticed? Because mm. that landing board is like that. By the way, that looks like a Star Wars landing bay for an aircraft. But, <laughs> or sun shades for your eyes. But anyway, the bees, when they're coming back and they're loaded with pollen and nectar and they're having a hard time, that shields them from a side wind. Because yeah. I, I do these slow motion sequences and you'll see them get close and then they'll just barely touch and then they'll cut off to the side. So when we get these strong wind conditions, as you have in your hive top apiaries, your rooftop apiaries, yep. uh, that's an unexpected, just a channel that shields them from the side wind so they could get, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, actually don't need to apologize <laughs> at all. I, I hadn't thought about that. We've, yeah. we've noticed 
no issues with them flying in and out. In fact, one of the things um, in places where you have predators that are picking off bees from above, this actually yeah. acts as a protection against that as well. Yeah, right? I like so, it. So it's, you know, it's it's not just the inserts. You, you've also got, you know, this, this extra large landing board with some protection. So people, they ask me, you know, with the cones, um, you know, what's the ventilation like? And for us, we, we, we left the cones on um, through the hottest summer we had here. But remember, we're north, right? So this is not Texas summer. Uh, but we found that we actually, our, our hives were bearding less than our control hives. Some people are saying, well, if they're bearding less, that's like, because they can't get out. No, they get out and they actually beard on the underside here, mm -hmm. which again, gives them protection against predators from above on a hot day, right? So we mm -hmm. did definitely have some bearding on, on the underside there. Um, but we also noticed that um, the curing rate was the same. Remember, this is what we do is we look at honeybee health. So this is, this is what sure. we do for for a living, curing rates were the same. We didn't have any mold issues. Our, um, you know, production rates were were similar. Like, like all of our metrics were the same with with the cones put in there. But we'd never planned on the cones being in there um, twenty four seven when we invented this. Right, that was for right. bee vectoring. So what we recommend to people is if you don't have wasps um, or other issues that you need those cones on. Um, because that changes throughout a season, right? What we have issues with in, in the beginning of our beekeeping season is very different than what we're having issues with at the end of a beekeeping season. And so, you know, take the cones off and then you've got like this extra large landing board. And then if you want to do your treatments, then you can add the cones alternating in, or if the wasps or whatever predators you happen to have in your area start getting bad, then you can put the cones on, right? So, so, so there's some options with the cones. Yes. Fred. Okay. So the <laughs> the black the black interior liner at the bottom there does that have texture on it so that it can get a better footing or is it just smooth? Uh no. So we definitely. So we have um one of so so again getting a little bit into the patent stuff here, but I will tell you that we have different um textures at different places within the protective bee, and that's actually super duper important for it to function optimally for bee traction and for uh, bee repellent, right? Like, um, so, so it's actually just, and I say repellent, just making sure they don't go in the outdoor um, is, is uh, you know, part of, of the design itself, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you do have, so what's the exact RHR surface configuration? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so, but there is, that's all considered in, so that's good. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, and then, so talking about the multifunctionality here. So we have two, um, we have two entrance reducer sizes. So we have, they just are the same as if you had your little block of wood entrance reducer. And, uh, and so the nice thing about these is one, they don't warp. Right, I don't know about you, but about half of my wood entrance reducers have to uh, have a lot of manhandling just to get pushed in because yeah. they've, you know, started to to warp over time. Um, second, these don't get propolized in either. So when you want to change them out, they the bees don't propolize these. So you can just pull them out and then leave it open, change your your opening sizes, whatever. So. So we have uh, like the, the smaller entrance reducer size here that I'm holding up and then the, the larger, larger one as well. So you could put two of these in and have two entrance reducers, but what we usually do is we have, we have one entrance reducer on one side. And again, I always pay attention to where the bee traffic is when I decide where I'm gonna put my entrance reducer, which side I'm going to put it on. And then we put a solid one on the other. So um, that allows it to, um, to, you know, just basically mimic, ah, let me see. Sorry, I'm trying to hold this up and do this all at once. And these are extra tight junctions because mm -hmm. I mentioned it's ready for production. So, and, and can you tell, tell everybody you just like messaged me a couple days ago. So I didn't have a lot of prep time here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was this was a fast turnaround. Fast turnaround. So yeah. 
here you can see where you basically have like a solid side and then and this side too. So this spring, what we're going to be doing is we're testing, um, and we did we did do some testing in the fall as well, but we're gonna test putting some pollen patties, different types of feed in here, as well as some um, uh, sugar substance as well and see, see how that works. Mm -hmm. um, the idea would be that you would only feed it inside the hive if it's too cold for them to go outside to get pollen. Um, oh. or, like that so it's not it's not like i would oh so you're not i so you're not forcing them to take the pollen patties for example by forcing them over it you're using it as an emergency feed option where they could feed sheltered from the weather yeah. and i like that idea better because when you first said that oh pollen sub or patties i just thought ah force feeding the bees but now i understand better that it's making it available at the entrance rather than forcing the bees to traverse over that surface yeah yeah and it oh yeah so the, okay. it's this, this is completely like it's just basically like a little cartridge that's on another side that they can choose if they if they're you know you're getting towards um and again, it depends on where you are. So a lot of, a lot of my thinking is in our weather here, but when we get into um, spring here, it's raining a ton. The bees uh -huh. can't actually go out and forage even if there is forage here or it's really cold. So that allows us to add, you know, some emergency, um, you know, feed in, in yeah. here, whether you're, you know, trying to boost your numbers so you want pollen or if you just want sugar. And just, yeah, just to describe that a little bit too, that's a blocked side. So in other words, robbers from the outside will not be tempted to come and get immediate access to whatever that resource is. So your entrance is now shifted to one side. The feed is being offered on the closed off side. And I have a question about that too. Is there a, any kind of screened insert option so that people could use that to shift or transport a hive? Uh, yeah, so what we have right now is, is right now we have two solids mm -hmm. um, and the two solids came up because I happen to, one of my research apiaries is on a, a farm and the nearby farms actually spray with things that are pretty nasty for bees. So I have to close up my hives sometimes for about 24 hours or so. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for us, it tends to be during cooler weather that they'll do those, those sprays. So um so the two solid which is just this solid that you see mm -hmm. here and then you put on the other side uh those two solids are um are um you know for that short term we were thinking pesticide protection when we did mm -hmm. it but then the beekeeper said well if i want to do a short move that would also allow me to do that and if you had a screen bottom board you could use this as well if you were going to do a longer move but i wouldn't do it mm -hmm. unless you unless you have more airflow because the bees will definitely heat up during right. the move, right? right. Uh, so in the future, what we're looking at is having um, a couple, we're going to, we call this a plug and play system. So now like this is all we have to do is we just have to make different inserts that allow us to do all sorts of different things. So, so we've designed a, a swarm preventer. So the swarm preventer would be, for example, you know, you you know your bees, you know, they're getting they're getting swarmy, but maybe you have to work or you don't have your equipment in, whatever it is to do your split. It gives you like a day or two to do that, right? So so we're going to have like a, a mesh one so that that um, the queen can't get out, but the bees can still so go in. So a queen excluder entrance. Basically, okay. yeah, exactly. A queen yeah. excluder entrance. <laughs> like, that would be like a, a better way to say that. And yeah. then the second um, thing that you're mentioning, this this more, we, I think of it more as a robbing screen, uh, so that it's it's smaller smaller mesh um, that could be used if um, if you just want the robbing screen part, but you still want the maximum traffic. Uh, so you basically would have an entrance reducer on one side and then the 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 screen on the other. That could also be used if you were going to do moves as well to add in some some uh, extra ventilation during a moving period. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very good presentation. I definitely like uh, the different functions that you're demonstrating that that's capable of because the versatility of that, as you described, is really going to be key. I do have questions about, there are two other companies that come to mind right now that are kind of uh, compatible with what you're doing. So I don't know if you've reached out to either of them. One is a recent interview I did with Strong Microbials uh, they had a 
you, they have difficulty coming up with a delivery system. Uh, yeah, so Vera and I, uh, Dr. Strogolov, is that? Strogolova. Strogolov, Strogolova. She yeah. and I had a conversation last year. Um, and, and actually, it wasn't about the, the delivery system itself, but uh, because we're, um, we were, it was about B vectoring itself, so not, mm -hmm. not our protective B. And so um, I actually did do some um, studies in the fall with DFM. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it worked, it worked great. We have to mix our diluent and it, it gets into the hives and, and that can actually be used like for pesticides poisoning or just improving mm -hmm. um, the, the, you know, the microflora, the gut flora of the, of the, the bees. And so uh, we did, we, we reached out to them last year, but we were looking forward to, to following up with that this year because mm -hmm. we would love to partner Mm -hmm. and bring some probiotics uh, within our system. It's, they're, mm -hmm. they're already approved. It would be a really easy. Yeah, um, because I see a very, a very obvious compatibility with what they're trying to do. And then your system of getting the bees to, you know, bring it in because that's, that's their purpose. And also because now you said you did some practical testing with theirs. Now, did that extend to when you said it worked, that means it worked as a vector system. As a vector system. So, right. we, so you we, didn't necessarily prove or disprove that the super DFM was beneficial to the bees or did you? No, I, and I don't think we need to do that. There's been a lot of okay. studies that have shown that. So our, okay. our goal, so what we do is we'll take a powder or like we've done uh, thymol dust, we've done um, oxalic acid, like we, we, we've been trying all, and with that solid side, we've actually used, you know, um, hops, like we, we're trying everything to see, um, what, what things we can actually put in either through B vectoring or just having that cassette delivering system. And, um, and so in the case of the, the DFM, what we do is we would do a conventional application, which is just like a sprinkle on top of the, the brood chamber versus um, putting it in as B vectoring. And then what we do is, is in that case, um, those are just cultures. So we just plate it on cultures and we count our colony forming units and that lets us know if we're getting equivalent amounts of, um, of bacteria being delivered into the same place. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is really interesting. And then, so my second person, do you have an idea who I'm going to talk about? Paul Stamens, because- Oh, okay, okay. so- Okay, yeah, so. yes, yeah. Okay, so first of all, I love fungi, um, like I love the work that Paul Stamens is doing. The metahysium, um, metahysium research was actually done by scientists, and I just really, really want to- to highlight that, that the scientists should get credit for the work that they did. So they were funded by, by Paul, Paul's company, but the, the, the scientists um, did the work on, on this fungi. So, so can I talk a little bit about, are you okay if I talk a little absolutely. bit about yes. the fungi? Yes, wide open, right? absolutely. Right. So this is our passion. This is what we're working on. And this is actually what we're raising money uh, for with our Indiegogo. So, um, so, as I mentioned with bee vectoring out to crops, we were already using fungi. And these are special fungi called entomopathogenic fungi that will um, basically land, if you, if you think about it, they, they go onto the surface of a pest. And then they, they actually use um, two different modes to attack that pest and have that pest become its host. So it's kind of like a zombie thing, right? So <laughs> it's, it's really neat. So they, they go on and that fungus, it, it forms a, a sheet and it uses mechanical pressures to actually break open the, the hard shell, right? Of these, of these mites or, or whatever, beetles, there's different things that, that it will work on. And then it also is using enzymes to also get into, um, into the host. And then once the entomopathogenic fungi goes into the host, and in this case, we're looking at varroa mites, that's going to be our host, it starts replicating inside that host. And then once it's replicated enough, it actually just bursts open that host. And then, and then you know, you just have more fungi that then can go and infect 
um, the other varroa mites. And bees, they just clean it up. They're like, oh, mold, I don't want that, but they won't clean it off the mites. So, so it doesn't affect the bees, but it affects the mites. So, um, so those mites that I'm talking about, I said varroa mites, but originally the mites and stuff that we were looking at are the ones that were affecting crops. And that's why this B vectoring is so, so promising for the treatment of varroa mites is um, because we already know it works against those, those families, right? So, um, so we, at the same time, uh, they were working on their project. We were working, um, we had wanted to use what we call MET52, which is um, already used for bee vectoring for crops in the States, but it's been discontinued. So we, we wanted to go with something that had already been approved because then the approval process it, it, when you're just changing use, right? It's different than having to approve something completely new and different. And so um, we started working with another, another intimate pathogenic fungi called Bavaria bassiana. And, uh, and then they were doing, they'd been doing their work for a few years with the, the Metarhysium. And um, what they did was just a fantastic, um, huge project, huge undertaking is they took metahysium as we know it, and then they subjected it to conditions that you would find inside a beehive. So these fungi that would normally grow um, on crops, right? The humidity, the temperature is very different than what's happening inside a beehive. Mm -hmm. So they had to do what they call directed evolution, but it's just basically where you're selecting for mutations that allow for it to grow within those conditions inside mm -hmm. a beehive. Mm -hmm. So they, they, um, the, the, the researchers uh, was able to identify a strain that grew inside the beehive and also was able to kill varroa mites. This is huge. And I'm going to tell you why this is bigger than any other type of mite treatment that you're going to hear about. It's that double mode of action that I was just telling you about. It uses both enzymatic and mechanical pressures to get in. So mites evolving resistance to both of those things simultaneously is like, it will take forever for that to happen. Whereas when you look at Apstan or Apstan, like they're just a single, um, a single pathway they're affecting. And so it's easy to evolve resistance, but evolving resistance against these, these fungi is going to be very difficult for varroa mites. So it's going to not only give us an effective treatment, but a long-term treatment that, that we don't necessarily even need to be doing as much IPM. And, and when I say IPM, just for your, your listeners, where you, you don't want to be using the same thing all the time to treat mites or different diseases because you will get um, resistant species. So you really want to be using something different in the spring than you're using in the fall. And um, anyways, but, but that's, that's um, what they found. So, so while we were working on this, they came out with this and we were like, oh my gosh, we have a delivery system for, for what they have. We've been working on it too. And our Bavaria bassiana um, didn't work. So and it was no surprise to us because we hadn't, we knew we, we were questionable whether it would even grow inside the beehive because the conditions were different. And we knew what our next steps would be, but we hadn't got there. So we will continue on with the, the Bavaria as well. And so in the long term, uh, the bee vectoring with those, those fungi, fungi will uh, probably include multiple fungi, which then even a better attack against varroa mites and even harder for them to evolve resistance um, to those fungi. Because each one of those fungi is going to be using a different um, enzyme or, or mechanical forces that just slightly different that allow for protection mm -hmm. against varroa mites. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm really glad that you actually mentioned all of that because one of the, it's powerful, potentially extremely potent treatment for mites, living organisms against living organisms. But uh, the other thing is, what are the conditions inside the hive that are making that the most difficult? Is it CO2 buildup, humidity, just the plain temperature parameters inside the hive? What is it specifically that's currently been stopping that from being successful? So, um, so you know what, right there, Fred, is a fantastic question because um, 
we don't know what all the parameters are that are happening inside a hive that would make it ideal for these microorganisms. So when we grow these things in a lab, we pick a humidity level. It's high humidity, high humidity inside a hive, right? So, so we pick a humidity level that, that mimics inside the hive. Hives are very warm inside, especially in the summer. So we've got to pick a, a hotter temperature than these fungi would normally grow, um, which, you know, usually um, molds aren't growing at super high temperatures, right? So um, the, these ones in particular, because they're, they're just soil fungi, like, like just to match, that's where they would normally be growing is in the soil, which is pretty cool. So, so we're looking at temperature and, and the temperature and the humidity are the easiest things for us to look at. But if we uh, further are going to be making like an optimal fungus, we're going to have to be looking at um, all sorts of other um, conditions within the hive that could affect the mm -hmm. growth of those the, and the growth of those fungi on the mites, right? So mm -hmm. that that's the biggie. So um, yeah, when you're talking about you know gases, uh, those 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 gases are something that we have to to look at as well. So we have technology where um, we basically have um, little little chips or whatever that we put into a hive that will measure sort of all the gases, pressure, um, the temperature, the humidity, like we are measuring all those things to, um, you know, make sure we do that for our hive health anyways, but also to make sure when we're selecting for these fungi that, that we're, we're hitting as many of the parameters as we can, but it's really hard to select for something that has, you know, multiple mutations that will allow it to yeah. grow with all of these, all of these particular things. Yeah. And the other thing is, uh, would propolis have any impact, positive or negative, on that? On the fungus itself? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, the, 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 well, okay, so propolis and honey is a fungicide, right? So we, we don't actually... It, it's not gonna, it's not gonna necessarily, um, I'm gonna say no, let's just put it this way because our, our mites are in the cells with the larvae, um, uh, usually under capped, capped larvae. Okay. Um, and that's why it's really important to, when we deal with any sort of mite treatment that you're getting it, you know, early because you want to get under all those capped cells and there's no propolis in that. Right. right? Like, so there would yeah. be then no direct contact. So you no. wouldn't even, it's a, again, I, yeah. just, I just have to ask these questions because yeah. the man on the street. <laughs> and you know what? Your listeners so. are, are people on the street. So yeah, I appreciate the questions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know what? I think we've covered everything really well. And I wonder if in closing, there's anything else you'd like to mention or talk about uh, before we end the interview. Well, yeah, so of course, I'm going to talk about my Indiegogo campaign. So we have 16 days left. Mm -hmm. uh, we are at 209% of our goal. Uh, so that that feels great. We've got over 400 backers. And, uh, and so if we if, if you want to support um, one what we're doing, uh, the, the money that we're raising from this is actually going back into research. It's not lining anybody's pockets like we're you know, we're just, uh, we really want to continue this, this bee vectoring uh, research. And we're looking at all different possibilities of what we can do. Um, and we're also doing small hive beetle studies this, uh, this summer too. So the money will be going back into um, studying small hive beetle. We'll both be looking at physical uh, ways of deterring the, the small hive beetle, as well as um, looking at, at uh, using bee vectoring for the small hive beetles as well. And, uh, and I mean, the bonus is that the system is, is fantastic. It's so easy to use um, and it gives you a ton of versatility and, and you're gonna be ready when, as those powders come out, which, you know, we can, like I said, we can start off with these probiotic powders. We actually have um, for in places where people prophylactically treat for American fell root, we actually have the antibiotics tests done. And so we're working on getting labeling approved for that, for places mm -hmm. that the people are dealing with that. And, uh, and then of course, all of the, the just amazing things of the protective bee itself. Sorry, I have to make a distinction about the American fell root antibiotic treatment, just so that people understand that are listening 
We're not talking about treating a colony that has active American fowl brood. We're talking about adjacent colonies in the same apiary rather than being destroyed or infected, getting the antibiotic to protect them from that. Is that yeah, right? And, and no, so Fred, it's yes, I, I, but what we do here in Ontario is we do what we call prophylactic treatment. So when the spores are in a vegetative state, which we've had a lot of American fell brood over time, which means it's just in our soil, it's in our equipment, it, it's just, around. Mm -hmm. And so when the spores are in the vegetative state, which is in the spring, you can treat with uh, antibiotics to kill off those spores so that they won't be an issue through the summer. And so that's just a normal um, thing that, that we do here in Ontario. We recognize it's not done everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and of course, now people have to get a prescription for the antibiotics from their vets. So it makes it a little bit more complicated as well. So that's how we use it prophylactically. I am not going to give any advice in terms of if you have American fowl brood in your apiary, um, this would not work to treat American fowl brood. Right. And, and I won't even say what it would do for adjacent colonies either, because I don't, I don't feel I have the, um, I don't know what's happening in other places in the world regarding yeah. American fowl brood and spreading to say it yeah. would be okay to use our thing to treat it in, right. in that situation. So yeah. when I say prophylactically, that's when there are zero signs of American fowl brood, but you're doing it ahead of time. Sometimes people here um, will get a, a hive like a, that they've recovered from a building and they'll also treat it with um, the, the oxytet, the antibiotic in case it had fowl brood like in the building or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's another time that people use it here. But um, yeah, that's, that's what we need. Yeah, it's important to clarify that because uh, here in the state of Pennsylvania where I live, uh, you can't treat, you have to we have veterinarians that are being trained specifically for honeybee treatment and you do have to get a prescription. There's no wild west, do what you want to kind of thing. And it's important to touch on that because antibiotics, you know, there's a lot going on there. So we want to make sure that we're doing it right when we do it. Okay. Yeah. So did I cut you off? Was there something else that you were trying to say? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so let me, it's okay. So I, I sometimes talk, not sometimes, I always talk a lot. So, um, so about this Indiegogo campaign, so not only are people getting our device, but they're also getting a one year um, online mentorship. So what we're doing is we're, we're, we're developing in it a holistic program with Best for Bees where people um, will, we will let people know based on their regions uh, when they need to be doing the things that they need to do to make sure their bees are healthy. And our goal is to turn bee havers into beekeepers because a lot of people get bees and then they don't do the things they need to do to keep them healthy. And in fact, bee havers are the most dangerous things for bees because their bees get sick and then they spread it and, uh, and, and then it's a danger for everybody. So, so we really just wanna make sure that, that our hobby beekeepers that get into this are doing it right. And so we, we're gonna have this, this online beekeeping mentorship program that lets them know when they need to be doing it and when they should be doing it. And then next year we'll actually be rolling out um, a more holistic um, uh, approach where we actually um, will help people you know, get the things they need to keep their bees healthy because in the last little while, not only have people not been able to, um, or people haven't treated because they didn't know, there's an issue with getting it, knowing the right things to get, where to get the right things. Oftentimes when they get there, they're gone because they thought about it too late and the supply isn't there. So our goal is to, to basically make bees healthier. Uh, our motto at Best for Bees is saving the world's bees one hive at a time. And that's because honeybees need to be healthy for native bees to be healthy because they're all sharing from the same, the same cup, right? And Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's really important to, to recognize there's lots of different bees out there, but we can't just say one bee or the other bee. We need to actually make sure all the bees are healthy. Well, thank you so much. You gave us a lot of really good information. I hope people do check out the Indiegogo campaign. And uh, we're going to have to do a follow-up down the road to see how things are going and 
where we're headed. So thank you so much for your time today, Eric. I appreciate it. And uh, very valuable um, information here. Thank you so okay. much. Have a fantastic rest of your week. Thanks. And thanks so much for having me on. This has just been such a huge pleasure. I really appreciate great. it. Uh, absolutely. Thanks mm -hmm. again. All right. You have a great day. Yeah, you too. So thank you for watching another episode of The Way to Be. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider subscribing. There are many more to come. I'm Frederick Dunn, wishing you all the best in beekeeping. Thanks for being here and spending your valuable time with me.